Welcome to my Practical Malware Analysis um, Lecture Review. This is building Chapter 0, which happens to be the Primer. Uh, this is a quick, short, just Primer chapter. So we're going to talk about the goals of Malware Analysis. We're going to talk about some of the initial case history. One of the fun parts is when you start looking at this, let's assume an incident response uh, of a piece of malware found on a workstation. Typically, you'd clean the workstation, uh, maybe re-image it, and you're done. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. After you find the malware, you need to know specific items. Uh, did the attacker place a rootkit or a trojan on the system? Did the attacker migrate data? Uh, I'm in Nevada and data breach laws are, are serious. Uh, if it's a medical office <laughs> that deals with HIPAA compliance, so there are more things there. Another important question is, is the attacker really gone? What did the uh, attacker take or what did they add? How did the attacker get in and how can we make sure they don't get in again? Again, this is important to understand that it's not always about just fixing out or just fixing one issue. Sometimes it's about collecting the appropriate evidence analyzing the evidence and coming up with the appropriate conclusion, not making wild guesses and hoping that you're right. Uh, I say that because I'm dealing with situations now where one IT company literally is just making broad claims and through log analysis, through evidence collection, we were able to show that their initial claim was completely invalid. So. You want to base your conclusions off of facts. Here's a good case. Uh, when LinkedIn got a hit, nearly a million in the investigating and unraveling of the theft of multiple passwords. This was, again, several years ago. But the important part is, what happened afterwards? They spent a million investigating. After that investigation, they sent, uh, spent a lot of money trying to fix and upgrade and update their site security. So the majority of the money was not for the investigation. The money was upgrading their security. So the important part starts becoming, how do we review the malware? Uh, part of that's dissecting the malware so that we can understand its purpose, how it works, uh, how to identify it, how to identify signatures, how to identify what it was supposed to do. But all of this gives us one big goal. And that goal is, how do we prevent it? How do we find it, defeat it, and maybe eliminate it? All of this is a crucial part of incident response. So information required to respond to a network intrusion. So a big part of that is kind of what and when uh, an event occurred. Making sure that we uh, are reviewing and locating all infected nodes uh, of that event, how do we measure and contain damage, how do we measure it is going to be one big area because there's quantitative and qualitative uh, measurements, how to contain the damage is going to be dependent on uh, the type of attack or the event, next is finding the signatures for our IDS or IPS, so that we can prevent it, or the goal is to prevent it. 
the signatures, which we've talked about a little bit before, come in two major flavors, host-based and network-based. If we're talking host-based, this will identify files and registry keys on a victim's uh, machine or victim's node that could indicate an infection. When you know specific malware or virus or other signatures that you know are malicious, we can look for those signatures. Focus on what the malware did to the system, not the malware itself. Uh, these are going to be way different from antivirus signatures. Next is going to be the network signatures. And that is looking at how to detect malware uh, by analyzing network traffic. I have several challenges uh, actually for network uh, analytic traffic or network uh, traffic analytics. That way we can kind of see how malware can be uh, transversing the network and how we would be able to look at a PCAP file and analyze it to actually see the malware as it flows through the network. Lastly, for network signatures, it's going to be uh, it's a little bit more effective when it's made using uh, made using malware analysis because you can actually see the how the data or how the malware itself actually transverses the network, how it jumps from node to node. Uh, if it jumps from node to node, ports, uh, things like that. <laughs> false positives, false falses, or false truths, positive falses, all that lovely variation. <laughs> all of this can lead to uh, a lot of money when it doesn't need to actually have happen. A false positive is when a event triggers when it shouldn't. Uh, your thumbprint should be the one that unlocks your phone. But if I put my thumbprint on your phone, it should not. A false positive would actually be your phone reading my fingerprint as you. And then the consequences thereof because of that. So sadly, false positive is a huge concern, which we're going to talk about that in one, a later chapter, but I do want to bring it up now. So there are different ways to analyze malware. Uh, statically versus dynamic analysis. Those are the big ones. So static analysis examines the malware without running it. We're going to use things like the virus totals, looking at strings of code and just the symboler. Um, we're going to be using IDA Pro a lot. And that's, again, without running it. And static analysis has its benefits. Though, what happens when you want to see what happens when you run the malware? That is the dynamic analysis. That's where the malware is ran and you monitor for its effects. Typically, you do this within a side of a virtual machine. And we're looking at tools like RegShot or Process Monitor, Process Hacker, or Capture Bat. Because again, we want to see what's, what, what the malware is doing. Uh, for RAM analysis, we're looking at uh, Mandit Redline or I'm always, I always butcher the name. Phonatolith. Phon. At. Let's see. I cannot pronounce it tonight. But we're looking at both of those for RAM analysis. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a very short list. For basic analysis, we actually have Again, static and dynamic. A basic analysis, looking at the instructions, looking at the strings, looking at the virus total or the signatures of it. It's quick, it's easy, but it fails for more advanced malware because you can miss 
what happened. You can miss the important of the the importance of the behavior of the malware. You have basic dynamic analysis. This is easy, but does require a test environment. This does not work with all malware. Again, dynamic is running the malware, watching what it does. Static analysis is looking at the malware, not running it. And of course, we have a advanced analysis. The advanced static is more like re, uh, reviewing it with a disassembler. This is a lot more complex and does require understanding of assembly code. We also have the advanced dynamic. Again, this is where you're running the code. And this is where you're going to be running it in a debugger. This helps to examine internal states of all the running of malicious executables. This kind of sees what it draws on, what it needs, what other uh, program that might call on or try to infect. Again, the important thing to take from here is static analysis is not running the malware. Dynamic analysis is running the malware, but looking at what happens. Are there different types of malware? And that's an important concept because yes, there is different types of malware. Backdoors uh, allow an attacker to control the system similar to like a remote access Trojan. Botnet, this will act more like a uh, node being controlled by a command and control server. Basically the node will receive instructions from that CNC server and execute instructions. We have a downloader. This will be used to maliciously code that will exist only to download other malicious code. And this is typically used when an attacker first gains access. That way it can keep pushing an infection or infecting it with other malware. Other forms are information stealing malware, like a sniffer, keylog, or if uh, you do have one, a password hash grabber. A little bit harder for that, but I mean, I have seen them. There are launchers. This is malicious programs used to launch other malicious programs, typically used for non-traditional techniques to ensure stealth or greater access to the system. Because again, if you if you gain access to a system, you want to make sure you maintain access. So you may want to actually have additional malware or additional code there. So you have two or three or four connections just in case. We have a root kit, which is malware that can fill itself within the existence of other code, normally paired with some type of remote access trojan. A uh, good example might be a root kit that infects IE or Internet Explorer. That way, when you're opening Internet Explorer, you don't realize that you're not really opening up IE, you're actually opening up this root kit that is mimicking Internet Explorer or is infected Internet Explorer. But that way, when you start trying to find it, you just see Internet Explorer because the code is in our mingled with IE's code. We have scareware, and that's like the fake FBI warning messages. Uh, they're made to kind of frighten users into doing something. My favorite is, this happened a few years ago, but it was a pop-up saying you're caught by the FBI doing something illegal, and you had to pay a fine. And you could pay the fine in several different ways. And a Walmart gift card was one of those ways. And I kept telling people, if you if you were caught by the FBI, do you seriously think they're going to let you get away with whatever you did by buying them a Walmart gift card? And no one ever really stopped to think about it until after that. And then they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like, yeah, if you do something that's going to draw the attention of the FBI, they're going to show up at your door. Other types of malware are spam sending malware. 
uh, spammers. Uh, lastly, worms or viruses. That's malicious code, and it may or may not still be classified as malware. So we have two ways to look at malware. We have malware that's sent in mass, and this is intended to infect as many machines as possible, and this is the more common type. Or there's targeted malware, and this targeted malware is more tailored to a specific target. This is very hard to detect, very hard to prevent, and very hard to remove. And this does require way, way more advanced analytics than we're going to cover in this class or analysis. Spestnex is a great example. It was designed for going after a nuclear power plant, period. It was specific for that task made it very dangerous, made it very hard to find, and made it worthless for any other machine that it was infected uh, by, because it would not infect any machine. It was looking for a specific target. <laughs> Lastly, let's talk about general rules for analysis. Now again, these are general rules, not always the rule. Don't get caught up in the details. You don't need to understand every line of code. Focus on key features. Focus on the more obvious items. Again, this is an intro to malware analysis. This isn't going to be an analyzing every single inch of malware. Every single, uh, every single line of code of malware. That's not the point of this. Also, get used to using more than one tool. Try several tools. One tool will probably fail. Hence why you want a background of multiple tools. Don't get stuck on a hard issue. If you have an issue with one thing, keep going. Move on. Malware authors are constantly raising the bar and changing malware, so the analyst has to be able to adapt to that. Again, this is just a nice, lovely overview or primer for our book. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.